Um, thank you all for coming today. Um, again, if you guys, if some of you guys are in the halls, I encourage you all to come and uh, and join us in the uh, in the prayer hall. Um, we're gonna have a really rich evening, um, and we have different different parts to this event. Um, if you guys have gotten the schedules, you you might know already, but. Uh, in terms of, the, of what's going to happen, we're going to have uh, Dr. Michael Perez, who is a professor of anthropology at the University of Washington, giving a talk until Isha about racism. Now, uh, my name is Essie Nadim. Um, I'm the youth director here at MAPS. And the, the point of this event, Say No to Racism, is meant to be a youth-driven event. And what we want to do is we want to open a discussion about racism, especially racism within the Muslim community. Because we know that in Islam, racism is forbidden. Fortunately, we still see the strands of racism within Muslim communities. And the youth have actually worked very hard um, to put this event on. So after this talk, after this lecture, um, after Isha, we're going to ask you guys all to move over to the gym. Um, and then in the gym, the youth have actually set up culture booths. Uh, but it's not the traditional, normal type of culture booth. Uh, we basically assign each uh, group a different culture. So a culture that they don't know about. And we ask them to learn about the history of that culture, uh, learn about the struggles and achievements of that culture. Hopefully they learn uh, about their fellow Muslim brothers and sisters because we believe that two roots of racism are arrogance and ignorance. And if we can try to hit at that, we'll inshallah start to uh, dismantle racism within our communities. I don't want to take too much time uh, because we have an amazing speaker here uh, from the University of Washington. Then we're going to have some great uh, spoken word poetry as well at 8.30 by Amir Suleiman. And if you guys have heard it before, you know that we're very, very fortunate to have him. Um, but without further ado, uh, Professor Michael Perez. Assalamu alaikum. Um, how much time do we have so, so I know when to cut off? 7.45. Okay. Um, so I, I'll... Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, I want to say thank you to MAPS for having me. It's an honor to have a space in this community to be able to um, share with you anything that I have on my mind. Um, and I think this is an ex exceptional topic and I'm honored by the opportunity to be able to be the one to speak to you about this topic. So I thank you very much and I'm honored to be here. I want to thank Brother Asin, of course, who always keeps me in mind. He's always um, on top of keeping me involved and I have to give him credit for that because he's... Uh, he motivates me to be here, and it really is such an honor to be here. Uh, I am, I teach at the University of Washington, I'm also a Muslim, and I'll talk a little bit about my background throughout this, um, throughout this talk. I'll try to weave in certain aspects that I think are relevant. Um, and I do think this topic is, of course, relevant. It's been relevant for a long time, and it's going to stay relevant. And the question for us really is, what relevance will we give it to ourselves, to our own lives, and to the formation and existence of our own communities? So the first thing I think we should ask when why talk about racism or race to begin with? There are lots of reasons, but one we should just take a minute and reflect on the very diversity of our communities. I mean, if you take a look around this room, it's apparent that we're not a monolithic group, neither racially, linguistically, ethnically, or whatever sort of category we may want to use. We are, in fact, a very diverse community. Um, to give you a sort of a larger perspective of what this means, according to the Pew study on Muslims, and of course there were various problems with the Pew study, but I still think it gives us at least a pretty interesting sort of example about what kind of community we're talking about. 30% of Muslims on, their, on the Pew Research Project identified as white. And of course, we know that if you're an Arab in this country, there is no category for Arabs, so in all likelihood, you might have checked that box white because that's in fact the box that was created for you to check. Um, that may change in the near future, but until now, we know that Arab has been folded into whiteness. So 30% of Muslims identified as white. 23% identified as black. 21% as Asian. 6% Latino or Latina. And 19% checked mixed race. <clears throat> Of all those who identified as native-born Muslims, Muslims born within the United States, 40% of them identified as black. This is, these are, now this is an interesting picture of our community in a, at the larger level, but it also emphasizes the significance, um, the centrality really, of the African American community um, in the Muslim community of the United States, and the African American community as, uh, as a real central pillar of Islam within this country from the beginning of its foundings, to be very clear. 
Um, now, racism is the first thing to talk about. What is racism? Of course, we can always talk about racism as the person who hates other races. We think about the Ku Klux Klan men or something like this, the angry white guy who's screaming with a burning cross about black inferiority or Jewish inferiority or something else. And of course, that's a, that's a pretty good example of racism. But I want to start in, by talking about it in sort of two ways, maybe three, but two, do, two larger ways. The first is to understand that racism is an ideology of difference. It's really a way of thinking about the differences that exist between humans. It is an ideology that is not neutral, meaning that it doesn't just identify differences between people, it places those differences in a hierarchy and says that someone is either more human, more intelligent or whatever, and someone is less human, less intelligent or whatever it may be. It's an ideology that links biology um, with often things like morality. So we say those kind of people, and when we say those kind of people, we have some physical markers. Those people are untrustworthy. They tend to be like this, and these sorts of statements that are generalizing, but that link a biological marker of difference with uh, a morality or some social idea of difference. Now, that's a very rough sketch. It's a very abstract idea, but it's an important one. And it's always important, of course, to look at history. We know that race is not, um, is not a time immemorial concept. Yes, humans have always marked each other as different, but the way that they mark each other as different in terms of race as we understand it today and for the last maybe three to four centuries is a European invention. And it's important to pay attention to the history because that invention, that idea of human difference, meaning as Europeans, went around the world categorizing people in a scientific project to say we want to mark we want to categorize just like we categorize the differences between plants and animals we want to categorize the differences between um, humans on the surface that seems like a neutral fairly benign effort to do it's a uh, part of scientific inquiry except for the fact that when the Europeans were doing this they were doing this precisely at the time that they were expanding their control, subordination and domination over the darker peoples of the earth. So as they categorized those people as a particular group of people, it wasn't from a distance. It was actually from the intimacy of what we would call colonialism and a large project in by which European powers were subordinating and trying to justify their subordination of darker peoples of the earth. So racism and race, the concept or the ideology, really has its modern roots in European thinking and in a European project of colonial expansion and domination. Of course, one of its most grotesque manifestations was in, the, was in that a peculiar institution, as it was called, of slavery in the Atlantic slave trade. And so even though slavery has been around for a long time, and it's always been with us, the ideology of race as we know it today was inseparable from the development of a slave economy, which anyone from this part of the world is familiar with as it became one of the dominant modes of the economy in what became the new world. So, it's always, so even though we're talking about an abstract concept about human difference and hierarchy and ranking, we should always be attentive to the fact that this, this concept was always being worked out within a project of contact with people, but not of neutral contact with people, a contact with people that was invested in their subordination and exploitation. So it is a dangerous concept in that regard. We're stuck with it right now. We're not gonna get out of it easy, easily. We're gonna try to think maybe of some ways to do that, but it's important to know that this is where this history comes from. In contemporary times, we should know that also racism, especially today, we talk about it both in terms of a structure meaning that racism is both an institutional reality of society and it's also a cultural reality of society, meaning that it's structural both in a cultural sense and it's structural in an institutional sense of our society. What do I mean by that? Well, in just about every aspect of life in the United States, <clears throat> since its founding, you could see that race and racism were participating in the institutions of this country. So, for example, the economy. The economy was always structured along the lines of race. And that economy institutionalized differences of race between people. Um, 
For example, with the federal government after World War II, when the federal government intervened with the housing, with the federal, um, federal housing administration, one of the things that it did, which was great, was it said, we're gonna give, um, we're gonna lower interest rates and we're gonna provide better mortgages for families coming back from the war, including black families ex uh, who were coming back from the war. Except that when the federal government put these laws together, they put a line that said black families would be excluded from these benefits of society. And so the housing market today and the realities of our housing today, the institutional, the, inst um, the, the housing patterns of this country reflect the institutionalization of racist inequality by which whites were empowered by benefits that the government was willing to provide and, and blacks were systematically denied those same benefits. Um, so when we look today and we say, why do blacks live here and whites live there, um, there's an answer. And that answer is that racism was institutionalized in the housing market and in the economy. Um, it's also in education. Why is it today that after desegregation in this country, we still find that whites go to school overwhelmingly with whites and blacks go to school overwhelmingly with blacks? In addition to that, we find that where whites go to school with whites, they go to a better school. And where blacks go to school with other blacks, they go to worse schools. This is the institutionalization of racism. Um, the criminal justice system, we find that systematically, over and over again, if there's a murder case and the victim is white, the, um, the conviction rate and the punishment that's assigned is always higher than it if it's a black body that was killed. This is irrespective of the killer, meaning if you're a black or a white person, if you kill a white person, you're guaranteed a worse sentence than if you kill a black person because the value of black life has been devalued and institutionalized in the criminal system. So this is what we mean by the institutional or structural aspects of racism in the society. Cultural structures are different. These are part of our perception. These are parts of the ways that we look and think at the world, think about the world. So for example, beauty. We think about beauty and we think immediately that beauty is associated with whiteness. Beautiful hair is long, flowing, blonde hair. Right? This is part of the cultural perception, the institutionalization of racism at the level of our own understanding and cognition of the world that we live in. Um, it's also in the idea of moralities, that we value white morality, for example, in this country, above the morality of darker people. We think that whites are the, um, represent the most enlightened, the most cultured, the most sophisticated people, and we place a higher premium or value culturally on white things associated with whiteness than we typically do with blackness or brownness. This is part of the cultural structures. It's about the perception, the institutionalization of, of, of racism at the level of our own understanding and grasping apprehension of the world. Now, racism is not the same everywhere. We know that racis racism and, and has its own elaborations, even in one place. Over time, those elaborations are different. So we shouldn't make the mistake that many Americans do, which is to see that the, re the, um, the rest of the world in terms of our own racial understandings Race works differently in different places, but nonetheless, at its fundamental um, at root is the same. Uh, uh, an ideology of difference that places somebody in a better position and rationalizes that better position in somebody at a different one. Now, we live in a racist society, period. There's no way around it. I, I know that that sounds harsh. That may sound like a very um, off-putting thing. It's certainly at odds with the meritocracy of the United States and the mythology of the United States, but the fact is this is in fact a racist society. You don't undo four centuries of institutional racism. That doesn't change, that doesn't get undone in one generation. It doesn't get undone in two generations. This is a society in which racism still structures the way we see the world and the way we live in that world. Now most of you I imagine are like me in the sense that your parents or yourselves came from another country. Most of you, I would gamble. My parents came from Cuba. So I was born in the United States, but my parents came from Cuba. And Cuba has its own racial history. It's part of the same colonial project. Cuba was a slave port. It has, um, in fact, it was a, uh, one of the main stations by which slaves were then sent off to different parts of what became the Americas. But my family came here, and I grew up learning racism. I internalized, I learned how to be a racist at the cognitive level 
um, just like anybody else raised in this country. And my parents learned it. As they came to this country, what they learned was to almost um, navigate two forms of racism, one from Cuba and one from here. I learned from my family how to be racist. That, that's, that's okay to say that. It's just the fact of the way things work. I learned, for example, right away um, that the word negro, which means black, was used almost exclusively where white was never used. If you spoke about people, you spoke about people as people. And of course it always meant white people. When you wanted to say somebody specific, you would always mark them by blackness. The black, the black man, ese negro, or something like this. So, um, and of course there were other aspects in my family in which we learned that it was culturally okay to talk in ways that were disparaging about certain people and blacks in particular. Um, and I also grew up learning racism within my experience of the United States. I grew up in a neighborhood where I could count on this hand how many black families lived there. And that was, that was not, uh, I mean, as a kid I would have never understood this, but it was a, the fact of where I lived and how few black people were in that community was a fact of learning how racism worked. I was internalizing the sense that black people were separate from me, were somewhere else, and that my community didn't necessarily include them. Um, I also learned that friendships were formed in ways, and many, many of you maybe in school learned the same things, that you ha race divides our friendship lines. We group ourselves with those who we feel most comfortable with. We don't question why we feel that comfort. And we gravitate towards those people, and we reproduce those lines of racism that precede us. We just reproduce them by doing things as simple as choosing who our friends are going to be in our schools. And I say that to say that <clears throat> I was socialized to be racist, and I was socialized by a racist society. All immigrants enter this country, and it is they enter a racist society. That doesn't mean you're a racist, but that means that you, what it means is that when you come to this country, you have to be honest with yourself. You have to understand that what you are entering is a society defined in part by racial distinction. And not simply that it's defined as such, but that it has great repercussions for the people who live within those identities within this society. You can't escape it, no matter how not racist you are. You are participating in it. You have a country with a deep fundamental history of slavery. You have a, a country, yes? Hearing, yeah, I'm sorry, it's maybe it's gonna be. So this, where does this go, my head? Yeah. Okay. Like this? Yeah. Okay, this feels awkward. I'll try this. This feels a little awkward. Okay, I'll keep this thing, um, close now. This is a country with histories of slavery. This is a country with history of Jim Crow. This is a country with deep legacies of racial division and distinction. You don't come into a country with this history and, and sort of live outside of it. You are a participant in that, in, into that racist society. And so the question becomes, how does one participate in that society? Um, for example, just think about the neighborhoods we choose to live in or our, our parents may have chose to live in. They tried to make those choices probably the best that they could. We want to live in good neighborhoods. We want to live in places where you have good schools. Those are very reasonable things to do. But that choice is not neutral because those choices are often set up in a way where the best schools are in the whitest neighborhoods. And the best neighborhoods are the whitest neighborhoods. And the best of resources are not in the neighborhoods where blacks live in this country. And so when you make that choice, which is a very reasonable choice, you have made a choice, but, but it is one that implicates you in the reproduction of, of separation and division in this country. And this is something we have to be attentive to because you don't overcome racism if you don't understand what, how you're participating in it. In other words, we situate ourselves in a racist society, participate in it, and are even socialized by it. Now I see the time is going by very quickly, so I'm going to try and move a little quicker here. Um, I ra gained my racial consciousness when I joined the Nation of Islam. That's how I became Muslim. And I'll give you two quick things that I think are worth mentioning here. You know, when I went in there, it was the, a very odd experience to me because it was the first time that I sat in a room in which I had a black teacher and I had nothing but black people around me and me and my brother and maybe two other Latinos were the minority. I never knew what it was like to feel like a minority before, but not in the disempowered sense. It was humbling. 
And one of the great lessons the nation taught me was how to sit comfortably and learn from black people, something that my country had never taught me to do because all the history I learned in my upbringing in this country was that white people made all the contributions. And every February when we have Black History Month, we return to the same figure of Martin Luther King. I didn't learn a single new figure. So all my life I was socialized to believe that anything that was going to come good was going to come from somebody that was white. And I had no idea what blacks could offer because I was never taught that blacks had anything to offer. And in the Nation of Islam, I learned that was wrong. I learned that I could learn from black people. In fact, they're the ones that gave me my racial consciousness. For example, one of the things they taught me as radical it was, they said, the black man is God. Now that sounds shocking. That sounds, how wrong? How could you say, the black man is God? Well, I'll tell you what, before I walked in the room, I thought that God was white. I could not imagine that blackness had anything to do with divinity because I had been so thoroughly brainwashed into thinking that whiteness was superior and if there was a God and it had anything to do with color, it had to be something white. I grew up with the image of Jesus, the white Jesus, all over me as I was a Catholic. I had no dark-skinned people in, my, or in, in the iconography of Catholicism and Christianity. It was all white people, European images. So when they said the black man was God, I came to, under I came to understand that they were reorienting me to see that blackness was something much more profound than what white racist society was trying to make it out to be. They also gave me a framework. When I grew up in Miami all my life and we were always told to lock the doors going through this neighborhood because that's a bad neighborhood, which was code word for black, I had no idea why that was. I just assumed, well, blacks live here and this is a dangerous neighborhood, there's crime and blacks must be criminals. But it was the Nation of Islam that taught me to understand why is that? Why are black neighborhoods wherever you go in these conditions that they're in? And they gave me a framework to think and said, how is it that white society lives so comfortably knowing that black society is so thoroughly excluded from the benefits of the society that whites enjoy? And one of the most profound things I, I like to say that Elijah Muhammad was, he was given an interview one time um, by a white interviewer. And, um, you know, the, in the nation of Islam, they'd say the white man is the devil, and we, we'll leave that aside for now. But one of the interesting things was then the interviewer asked Elijah Muhammad, he said, um, do you really think all white people are devils? And so Elijah Muhammad said, well, I'll ask you this, are you good? In other words, we just, we're just taught to think white people deserve the benefit of rightness of um, enlightenment, of all things that are good. But when you look at historically at what white people have done, when you look at how white people have produced whiteness as an exclusive category, Elijah Muhammad was asking, don't ask me why you think I think, why I think you're a devil. Show me as a white person that you care about our situation enough to show that I don't have to think that you are a devil. Now I'm not saying that we need to call white people devils, but I'm saying this clicked for me because I had never understood that I could actually question whiteness. I had grown up my whole life believing that whiteness would be something that was self-evidently good. And black, the blackness had the burden of proving that it wasn't, that it wasn't bad. And the Nation of Islam helped transform that for me. Now I'll move um, on to a couple things and talk a little bit about where I think racism in our community is and where we need to go, because I see we're running out of time. The first thing i like to say is we need to sober up on Islam and say that Muslim history is not free of racism. I know we think, you know, we talk about Bilal and we talk about these great historical figures, but we would be deceiving ourselves if we talked as if um, Islamic history was somehow free of racism. Um, now first, we should acknowledge that racism among Muslims in Islamic history is not the same as racism in the American sense. It'd be, a, it'd be wrong to conclude that racism in Islamic history is anything like the racism of the United States in its own history. These are distinct systems. So, for example, in Islam, in Islamic history, we know that we had societies with slavery, but they were not slave societies. The United States, for example, the entire slave structure was dependent on racial distinction. In the Islamic world, slavery um, even if it overlapped with race, it was never defined by race. So it's important to note that there are differences here, and it's not to say that Muslims are the same kinds of racists in our past as American Europeans are. That would be a very dangerous mistake, and I want to put that on the table first. But we should acknowledge that some form of racism existed in our tradition, and I'll give you a few quick examples. 
Ibn Khaldun, who was our famous sociologist, one of the founders of sociology, theorized social change. He said of blacks in the southern parts of Africa, quote, that they are not to be numbered among the humans. This is what Ibn Khaldun said about southernmost Africans. There was the Meccan jurist Taos from the 8th century, who apparently indulged in the habit of not attending weddings if the weddings were between anyone identified as black with somebody white, and using the Quran, he said this was an unnatural union. So this is part of our tradition too. Early Maliki jurists held that under normal circumstances, a valid marriage contract required a wali to be present. The exceptional circumstance, they said, in which a wali would not have to be present was when, in cases in which, quote, the woman hailed from lowly origins, meaning she was ugly or black. The requirement could be relaxed because blackness was seen as an affliction in the eyes that reduced women's standing in society. And the eight, in 18th century, the jurist Al-Dardir, um, if I'm saying this correctly, categorically affirmed that um, anyone who said the Prophet was black, was um, peace be upon him, was guilty of kufr. This was his declaration. So, I say this not to say that we are an awful community, or that these people's contributions should be dismissed because of it, because of it but to say, let's not be naive. Let's open our eyes and understand that our predecessors also were faulted. And that's okay, and it's our task in our contemporary moment to do something different. So how do we see contemporary racism in our communities? <coughs> One is simple, terminology. How many of you have ever heard somebody referred to a black man as an abid? I know I have. This is, this is language that's unacceptable, to refer to somebody by virtue of a status rather than by virtue of the dignity that everybody is afforded in Islam. And every culture and society seems to have its own terminology and it always seems to reserve the worst for those who are the darkest. I don't know how widespread this is, but I know it's widespread enough to say that we in our community have a problem with the way we even talk about one another and our terminology. Another issue where we see racism in our community is marriage. How many of us would allow our children to marry African Americans? How many would, have, would be comfortable doing that? Now, this isn't to say that we, don't, we shouldn't have preferences for who our children marriage, who our children marry. I knew I had a dear friend who was, who was Palestinian, and he want, his parents wanted him to marry Palestinian, and I completely understand that, and I don't think that was a reflection of racism at all. But had he wanted to marry a black woman and his parents said, you cannot marry a black woman, then you've crossed the line. So we need, marriage is one of the cases in which I was looking at before I did this talk. One of the most common ways that Muslims talk about discrimination in their community is marriage. It happens on ethnic lines, it happens on class lines, but the most absolute line that's drawn is between black and any other group. There's also the question of marginalization. Blacks are often excluded from our masjids because, first of all, the location of the mosque. How often are mosques built sensitive to the needs that, of the African American community and sensitive to the awareness that many, many, many people in the African American community are actually Muslims? I'm from Lans I was in Lansing, Michigan. We have a beautiful community over there. They built a mosque when one, uh, one was already built. There was an African American mosque in East Lansing when the second mosque was built. And that second mosque came to siphon all the resources off of that first community. Nobody thought to ask, does the black community have a mosque? Let's build it with them. Instead, they built it somewhere else. And I'm not saying they did it because they were racist or they did it because they didn't like black people, but it was, the race, it, was, it was racism that was structuring the assumption that we didn't have to ask if there was a need in the black community for a mosque or if there was already one, what to do with that mosque so that we can strengthen the unity of that community. There's also the substance of mosque efforts, what mosques do that excludes African Americans. We'll have fundraisers for Syria, and we should, but did we have a fundraiser for black families who have lost their homes or who have children have been incarcerated? Do we ever do any financial contributions or efforts to help aid the, uh, heal the wounds of the black community? We all rally for Palestine. I do. I do. I rally for Palestine. I've devoted my life, in fact, in many ways to the Palestinian struggle. How many of us stood with the Black Lives Matters campaign? Did we even mention it in a khutbah? 
Do our khutbas include topics that are sensitive to the needs of the African American community, Muslim or not? Um, in our mosque structures and in our politics, are we, are we concer concerned with the status of African Americans in our community? Are we interested in the kind of lives they lead when they live in some other part of the city that we don't live in? These are, mar these are forms of marginalization that are taking place throughout the country that are disadvantaging African American communities and disillusioning them um, about the nature of the development of Islam in the country when they played such an instrumental role in making Islam possible here in the first place. We also have economic exploitation throughout Chicago, Detroit, Los Angeles, Miami, and Nation of Islam, my, the mosque right across the street. We had an Arab brother who opened a store. What kind of store was it? It was a liquor store. And he used to tell us we weren't Muslim because we were in the Nation of Islam while he sold pork and booze to African American clients. Did he live in that community? He didn't live in that community. He, lived, he made money from that community and he went somewhere else. Now I don't think this man came and built that store there because he's a racist and hated black people. But once he built that store, he had, to, he had a responsibility to the community he was in. He put no money back into that community. And this is a pattern and a common complaint we find in African communities all over. Where foreign immigrant communities come, they, they start entrepreneurial projects like, liquor, like small convenience stores, which we should not, we understand why they're doing this, but then they end up exploiting the black community and treating them like nothing more than a prophet, inattentive to the conditions of that community and how they became the way they were. So solutions. I wanted to start with actually reading to you from um, Malcolm X's letter during the Hajj, um, after the Hajj actually, because I think it's, sort of, it's important. I'll do this and then I'll um, give a few tips and then I think we can conclude. This is Malcolm X. There were tens of thousands of pilgrims from all over the world. They were of all colors, from blue-eyed blondes to black-skinned Africans, but were all participating in the same ritual, displaying a spirit of unity and brotherhood that my experiences in America had led me to believe could never exist between the white and the non-white. America needs to understand Islam because this is the one religion that erases um, the race problem from its society. Throughout my travels in the Muslim world, I have met, talked to, and even eaten with people who would have been considered white in America, but the religion of Islam in their hearts has removed the white from their minds. The whites, as well as the non-whites, who accept true Islam, become changed people. True Islam removes racism, because people of all colors and races who accept its religious principles and bow down to the one God, Allah, also automatically accept either each other as brothers and sisters regardless of differences in complexion. If Islam can place the spirit of true brotherhood in the hearts of the whites whom I have met here in the land of the prophets, then surely it can also remove the cancer of racism from the heart of the white American, and perhaps in time to save America from imminent racial disaster. The same destruction brought upon Hitler by his racism that eventually destroyed the Germans themselves. And in the last, second to last paragraph he wrote, the Quran compels the Muslim world to take a stand on the side of those whose human rights are being violated, no matter what the religious persuasion of the victim is. Islam is a religion which concerns itself with the human rights of all mankind, despite race, color, or creed. It recognizes all, everyone, as part of one family. This is Malcolm X writing in the 1960s and his reflection from the Hajj. When I look around the Muslim world and I look at our communities, I think of Malcolm X as, an, as unfortunately visionary, but not an accurate description yet of where our communities are, and more an indication of where we need to be and the responsibility we have given that our religion is intolerant of any distinctions that place one person above another. So some solutions that we can um, conclude with in the last three minutes. The first is terminology. It doesn't take much to stop calling a person Abid. We need to change the way we talk about one another and one another's communities and not allow for racial distinctions, racial languages, ethnic languages to transform the way we see and think about others and we should be striving for a language of equality, a language that honors everybody 
as equally valuable, regardless of what their differences may be. In terms of marriage, we have to stop the barriers. We have to have an honest conversation about how our families are formed in a context with such enormous racial diversity as you see in this room, and be unafraid to embrace African Americans as part of our families, to accept others as part of our families, and see this, is that Islam makes us brothers and sisters and gives us the input, all the reasons to be family. We have to end the economic exploitation of our communities. If we know that our brothers and sisters are making money selling liquor in those community, in black communities, we need to give them incentives to stop doing that. We need to be honest with one another and say how this sort of practice helps to destroy communities. We should be thinking in ways that helps encourage our brothers and sisters to make money in ways that benefits the communities that they make money from, that gives back as much as it takes. We should also take the motto of learn from and work with. We can start by acknowledging that Muslims, black Muslims and African Americans have a lot in common with what all of us do. Before and still, this cliche was you were guilty of driving while black. The Muslim side of that coin is you're guilty while flying Muslim. We have a lot in common. Black Americans understand the systems of surveillance and control better than we do because they've been living under them for so long. We have so much to gain from their knowledge and their experience and reach out to them and say, how can we help one another in the same struggle, which is the struggle against racism in society, for the benefit of all of us, not simply for one or for the other. Um, we, the, we, we, also, we need to learn from their experience and we need to challenge the indifference in our communities. We need to put black Americans' concerns at the center of our communities since our communities are interested in justice. Yes, we should care about Palestine. We have family members there. We should care about Pakistan and other places where Muslims are suffering. But we can't continue to ignore the suffering of the people in this country in which we now live. We have as much an obligation to the downtrodden of this country than we do in any others because Islam doesn't prioritize one life over another at least in the perception that Malcolm offered in his, in his reflections on the Hajj. Everyone loves to say how the Hajj transformed Malcolm to a Sunni Muslim, but nobody wants to talk about what kind of Muslim he was. He didn't abandon the struggle for liberation. He just expanded his conceptions that enabled him to embrace everybody in the common struggle for freedom. And I see that I'm over, so I think it's time to close, and I really thank you for letting me do this, and I hope that every, something I said to you was of benefit um, Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. We have, uh, we, so we have to go for prayer. Uh, Michael Perez and uh, Amir Salman as well. They're going to be um, in the gym for the second half, so you can go up to them and, and ask them questions, inshallah. Um, I just wanted to again remind everyone we're going to break for Salat right now. I wish we had time for questions, but we need to, we need to keep going. After Salat, I encourage all you guys and girls to go to the gym. The MAPS Youth Group has put on a culture fair where they've been representing cultures that they're not a part of. So for 30 minutes, they're going to be showing you guys uh, what they learn about other cultures. Um, we also have some video testimonials of youth that have experienced racism and we want you guys to listen to that as well. At 8.30 we're going to have spoken word and poetry performances by one of our youth and by Amir Suleiman. So please be ready for that. It's going to, you know, this evening's not over yet. We have quite a bit to go. So inshallah you guys can uh, benefit from that after Salat. Salat <coughs> Thank you, Asim.